Good evening, and welcome to Breadcast. <laughs> no CSA, I wonder what we're going to talk about, though. One more topic. <laughs> Anybody? It's Did you listen to our Vibes podcast? I no, I haven't. Would recommend. I think it's one of the, like, it's I need one to, of my I favorite. need to get back into it. I, I haven't, I didn't know you guys were, like, consistently publishing things, They're to be not. honest. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're publishing. We've actually, we've only missed one, um one week so far of recording um and then and we recorded rich and i sat down and recorded like two episodes nice yeah we got them posted just in time to the budget vibes because <laughs> what what we did is um i was just like hey let's record a podcast on vibes and i was like okay and then i think i went to the bathroom and then we came back and we just got started yeah and it was really really good so such an abstract mm. topic. Yeah, well, old <laughs> yeah. News now. well, those kind of topics work really we got, well. We got yeah, that's news. true. There's a lot of a lot of ways to go. Oh gosh. How about you, Eric? Anything that's been going through your mind? Any topics that are abstract and open? <laughs> nah, dude. I've just been to... grinding on stuff. <laughs> mm. We need for room in here, man. All right, topics. <laughs> work. Work. Crypto suffering. Glycerin. Suffering. That, that, okay. Oh, uh, God. Suffering. Do we have to tell the story? That's a pretty heavy one. Uh, suffering is a good one. Yeah, I actually, um, see, this is directly in our sight line, you guys. Yeah, I can That's like fine. I don't like looking through it. Yeah. Well, that one. Hmm? We're, we're, hmm? Are you leaving for Rune? Yep. Oh, no. What are you going to say, What? You getting some settled on chicken nuggets? Dude, I wish. Yo, they have this like. Oh wait, were you? Oh yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, were. I was there. I, thought, I, was, I, thought I was gonna tell you about that fucking chicken. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty good. I didn't I'll give Seven Eleven credit really for that one. Dude, dude, that shit is so good. Coffee. It was like now sriracha, violent, sweet but, you know, sriracha or something. Oh, you're so oh, picky. God. <laughs> We're just now now it's it. completely blocking my vision. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, it's kind of in the way here. Yeah, Dude, I saw this uh, YouTube channel today. That was this guy from Philly who was just like, he was like a vigilante, but for like really ridiculous things. Like there was this guy who was just like picking up all the rolls with his hand and then like sniffed them and like, was just like oh i don't like this one and just put it back and he was like yo you're supposed to use the fucking wax paper and just like went off on this guy and like made him pick up and buy each piece of bread that he touched and he records it's himself doing this justice. yeah and then i found out later that he's just a comedian and it's all staged Aww. but <laughs> it's pretty funny because he like i was like watching him like this guy has balls like, he would, like, yell at people and, like, pull over and get out of his car and, like, approach them and start oh, yelling. And I was like, oh, shit, dude. This is, like, Philly. You're going to get your ass kicked. In. But, that's kind of how I imagine everybody in Philly. <laughs> yeah, Philly's scary. I don't like it. Yeah, dude. Ever since watching It's Always Sunny, I just have that, that impression of Philly. But, I don't know. Man. I haven't been in a while. <laughs> no I, I, I went to Philly once and I liked it. It was nice. They've got a great art institute there. They do. Oh, word. Yeah. And cheese sticks. And cheese sticks. They're known for those. That's true. My high school had this challenge, which I never did because it seemed super dangerous to me. Because it was like, we have like a seven hour school day. And it's like a three and a half hour drive from my high school to Philly. And you were supposed to like be either like in your car or in the school when the first bell rings. And you have to book it to Philly eat a cheesecake or a cheesesteak yeah. not cheesecake and then make it back to the school by the last bell yeah I th- we and had I was that like, too at Marshall yeah Wait, I was like what? this just seems <laughs> a Philly cheesesteak challenge yeah yeah honestly like, that seems healthier than thing. today's challenges yeah that's true I don't know true. what the kids are doing <laughs> what are the kids doing uh, eating Tide Pods that's oh jeez <laughs> oh, yeah that's pretty old I, I haven't kept up but they do look like candy I saw some kids chugging <laughs> salt <laughs> salt? Yeah, I don't know. I you saw like, them? Not like the real. <laughs> <laughs> I just pictured like a ga- gaggle of ne'er do well. Right. It's like on, on the curve. Their... Yeah, that's what I was exactly. <laughs> like, one of those big like salt things. Yeah. <laughs> just poured it in. Got some of that Morton's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
How are we looking on those levels? Our levels level? Looks good. Uh, it just looked like we were recording over stuff to me, but I don't think we are. I was thinking yeah, about, sure could I get all my nutrition from the Chipotle trash can? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Is that public dude. access? Dude, I saw, so I saw one uh, little clip on YouTube of Live PD where this guy was like going through a dumpster and he was like, yeah, man, like I know the manager, like he says, just don't do it during business hours to scare customers. And he had like his entire car filled with like stuff that was like about to expire in a There's day a lot of stuff that like they've that thrown they throw out. out. Yeah. yeah. And he, the cops were just like, I mean, like I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but I guess <laughs> it's not illegal. And they just yeah. like let him go. Yeah. So I think you can do that as long as the like, but I think, if the restaurant found out, they could tell you to get the hell out right. of there and stop doing it. Yeah. But Chipotle is the perfect place to do it because if you just find a trash bag full of food, you mix it all up and you got yourself a Chipotle Ew. bowl. <laughs> <laughs> there That's are true. restrictions though on um, like restaurants being able to give their food away, and same with like supermarkets. Um, yeah. Because even though they, it might be like a liability issue, or it's like really expensive to try and have them like always ship it to people. Yeah. And so they just often opt out and just throw just it away. Just throw it out. Yeah, because it's easier, but it's really sad because it's super wasteful. Yeah, which sucks. Like. And even if people will ask, like they say, like sorry, we can't. So I think it depends on where you are. Yeah, I'm sure there are already like charities that kind of do that or like go around and like. Dumpster dive. Have some like, not dumpster dive, <laughs> but have like some connections with restaurants where they're like, yo, can we like take your almost expired food to the shelter or something like that? There's there definitely programs some. like that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, a lot of still goes to waste. I don't think it's widespread. Yeah. yeah. As you would hope. Yeah, that's true. I hope it's not widespread. Because I. Because you want your garbage bag full of Chipotle. Yes. <laughs> I'm on a mission to eat all my food through Ugh. the trash. <laughs> Extreme like cheapskates. Some terrible food poisoning at some point. I feel like we have, as humans, pretty good intuition as to what should and should not be eaten. All right. Really? You're going to yeah. speak for the whole race on that? Because <laughs> and, 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 all the ones who can't speak on it aren't here, and they're already packed. <laughs> <laughs> All, all the humans left seem to have pretty I mean, good like intuition. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that's, yeah, that's just don't game. kill yourself with it. Yeah. I think the more germs you get, the better. The sickest person I know cleans your house of bleach like twice a week. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I think there's oh, it's definitely, definitely like true. I yeah. think like, there's a the sweet spot. The adapts to hmm? like the shit that's being thrown at it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a sweet spot like. You want to clean your house sometimes, at least. <laughs> but like, and that sweet spot is once every three weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so. No. Yeah. Cool. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Odin. Um, our topic for today is... Nothing in particular. Nothing in particular. That's Nothingness a great topic. is our topic. Yeah. How are we gonna do suffering or suffering? So I want to do suffering, I but I want us to watch this. Uh, I oh want... no! Yeah, yeah. I think we gotta get in the mood. Yeah. The, so, Chris, uh, we probably shouldn't get. Okay, this is gonna be a sneak preview for an <laughs> upcoming podcast. But Christina and I watched a nature documentary because I was like, I want to watch a nature documentary because I love them. And then um, we were picking them, and I was like, ooh, like polar, you know, ice cap, you know, like Arctic region. Yeah. Whatever. I was like, that sounds cool. And Christina was like, oh, no. And um, <laughs> I knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah. And it was some of the most, de like, depressing footage I've ever seen in my life. Like, genuinely some of the most horrible suffering I've ever seen. Um, and I won't spoil it because I'm going to make you guys watch. Like, Is it the Netflix I, I documentary? Saw. Yes. Wait, wow. what's it called? I want to watch it tonight. It's like Netflix's sad version it's of Planet Earth. It's our planet, and then our it's planet, like, but the it's polar frozen caps? worlds or something. Oh, I've like seen that, that one already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think oh I watched God. that as well. I wept. The one with the walruses. They're all just... Oh, I thought it was like go walruses, compete, compete, compete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I never know when I put on a nature documentary if it's just gonna be like exciting, like this crazy cool animal like like the archer fish or something like spitting bugs off the of trees and like yeah. snatching them up or if it's just gonna be completely depressing like <laughs> it's just, it's just i gonna... feel like the best ones are a mix of them because i was i was i i it took me a little while trying to like 
wrap my head around how I felt about this um, episode. I guess since enough of you guys have seen it, um, the, the there's this there's just a bunch of depressing stuff about the polar ice caps melting and like not freezing enough for it, the animals that had adapted to it originally. Yeah, and there's this one scene of like an, an enormous amount of walruses. <laughs> I'm talking so like many. tens oh. of thousands of walruses. <laughs> so terrible. Like all clambering on this tiny little outcropping of land because there's not enough for them because they're normally out on the ice caps, but they've melted. And they're just like completely jam-packed in each, over each other, walking over each other. And some of them are like climbing up this rocky like hillside to try and find space, but they weigh like several tons. And so they're just like barely getting up. And then they just start tumbling down. Yeah, they, oh, no. they <laughs> they're literally rag... falling off of a cliff. <laughs> and it's <laughs> oh, and you just watch them like and this is a thump, one after another, thump. like actually smashing into rocks on the way down. Oh. These t- two <laughs> ton creatures. It's the most. It's genuinely one of the most. Like I think one of the most. It was horrific. Horrific displays of like undeserved suffering that I've ever seen. Yeah. Of like, just their their evolutionary niche, their biome just being fucked, and then and then they're just like suffering horribly and it took a lot of like thinking to just even wrap my head around yeah Yeah. you know what's really sketch about like ice caps melting that i didn't realize until i heard it like two three weeks ago maybe yeah is that you know like methane in our atmosphere is a lot worse than even carbon dioxide like carbon dioxide is not good like but methane is like i think like physically it absorbs more energy and, and releases it back towards so it's more of a greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide and apparently there's a bunch of methane trapped under the ice yeah where if like enough melts we hit this point where like it starts releasing more methane even though we're not like it's not like us like emitting it from our cars but it's just like naturally stuck under there and there was like some crater where like a bunch of methane was just like suddenly released into the atmosphere. Which I, is... I think it's a bunch trapped underneath like the Siberian permafrost or something like that. Yeah, and something. if that thaws out, there is the possibility that a shitload of methane gets released. And it's the whole idea of a run runaway yeah. uh, climate change scenario where we trigger, um, you know, physical events that just mean it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's a real possibility. So, yeah, because like the kind of like the the climate is kind of like a sine wave over a very long time mm-hmm. and we need to make sure that we hit the top of the inflection point and come back down at least like and that's i mean you know you can't just keep going up exponentially or nothing's going to exist except for those little tardigrades <laughs> that can last forever <laughs> oh, oh somebody was telling me about they can survive in space the space, yeah, bears. Dude. space yeah. bears yeah those things are tough man yeah they're gonna outlive the human race for sure. Oh, for sure. So. They're like I think soft I saw an and squishy. Article saying that they're not immune to climate change, though. Very really? recently, yeah. That like, sounds like fear mongering. Like, Those things are invincible. Article. I don't what know, would though. get them though? I don't know. I didn't read uh, it, but yeah. it was saying something that even they cannot survive. That's where I draw the line. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, here, um, so it's interesting as we've been speaking here. It, we've been, um espousing a mentality that climate change is going to lead to the end of life on earth i don't know that that's the case i think new things evolve but precisely so and um there have been periods of um, um not human history but earth's history with much larger amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and much higher global temperatures um and we we are artificially creating one of those eras and um if i understand biology correct um, we're, we're completely fucking the world for ourselves and for a lot of the animals that are evolved to exist right now, mm-hmm. but the earth, the new climate will be like provide for new creatures and all that. So that's mm-hmm. one of the ways that like, I sort of wrap my head around climate change and still I'm able to step away with a picture of the world that isn't completely depressing, Yeah, which is that we're ruining it for ourselves and causing an enormous amount of suffering and a mass extinction for um, a lot of the biosphere. But at the end of the day, life goes on and life will, you know, live past us, which is 
basically saying we're all fucked. But, <laughs> but it, is, still... it is fascinating because as humans, we've only recorded maybe a couple hundred years of climate data out of the billions that has existed. And I think I had read somewhere that uh, in like the dinosaur era, and I could be off on this, it's been a while, they were closer to 3,000 parts per million of carbon in the air, whereas right now we're maybe around 100, 150. I don't, I don't know. But I think anyways, we're, we were up to like 400. 400, 400. Our baseline was like 100, I think. Hmm. But that was wild to me. I'm just, I don't know. It's hard to tell what the world is going to evolve into. And I kind of hope we turn into dinosaurs. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think that works. <laughs> what? I just, that there's more carb if we start to just grow scales, I thought. <laughs> yeah. What do you guys think about the idea of like not just not having kids because of climate change because they're they're consumers and like if we have more consumers i've i've heard it a lot i think it's kind of crazy i think a solid trade-off is having two kids for each couple because yeah. like then we're at like you know we're we're it seems to me like we're kind of approaching our carrying capacity mm-hmm. as a species so like if every couple just had two kids we would stay stagnant you know yeah but I mean, There's a lot of people who feel that way. Like, we need to reduce our population purposefully. To what? Save the population? That's just... Cause like, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, if you're well, not, like... It's if, one... Go ahead. Sorry. If these, like, children were just never conceived, it's not like... like They're growing It's up not like suffering. killing children or something like yeah. that. It's like... It's not like genocide to save the world. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's just like not Although doing it. Although I think there it. are a lot of people who believe in that. Yeah, I mean, that was like the, what was it, Avengers Endgame or whatever with Thanos? That was yeah. his motivation, which is really cool motivation for a uh, like villain because it's logical. Mm. It gives it more depth. Mm. But... Maybe chance. <laughs> Yeah, dude, you know what I'm worried about with coronavirus, particularly because it's been, like, it's been hitting the West Coast a lot, is the homeless people out there. Like, there were, like, I mean, there were, like, reports that, I don't know if they were exaggerated or whatever, if it was, like, a a similar virus, but there were, like, reports that there was, like, a case of bubonic plague in the homeless population. It's, like, if that's happening, like, how are they going to handle coronavirus with that? Are you kidding me? bubonic plague in the homeless population of LA no like San Francisco it showed up in LA or something I might be wrong damn. fact check me on that for <laughs> no, sure no, no, no. <laughs> like, I believe you but it's just like damn that's yeah but like what's going on I mean there? first of all the the two populations that I've been really worried about is the homeless population on the west coast and then like how many Uyghur Muslims have died in camps in China like they don't they're not testing them they're not looking for it they're not treating them probably not like, I mean, if you got to choose between mass genocide and a virus, I mean, good. Well, I think it's interesting when people are like, humanity is a plague on the planet, and like, yeah. that's implying that we should die then because plagues ought to be wiped out. Yeah. And so I find that somewhat disturbing. Yeah, like that's like your ancient towards genocide. Yeah. Like. And I think that's a common thing people say, like maybe not consciously, like they're thinking about the deeper meaning behind it. But people say that like, oh, humanity sucks and like we should die. And Yeah. Oh, well, I think it is a it, it, it is a true statement that humanity is so bad for everything else that, that is living in on the planet. Like every, from the perspective of every other living creature, we are a mass extinction event. We are the meteor that, you know, wiped out the dinosaurs. We are a super volcano. I don't know. I think corn would say thank you. How much? That's true. Right? It's There's true. a couple exceptions. A, um, but that's kind of the point that I guess um, that I'm getting at. But if is, we die, corn won't survive. It's, that's actually true. Yeah. Also dogs. I think dogs would thank us. Yeah, that's true. But and like cats. the the I guess the point I'm getting at is I think it is true to say that we are a plague in a sense on the planet. Mm. But it, that's a true statement. The next step is trying to figure out how to make sense of that. What does that say? Does that mean that it's time for us to start genociding ourselves? <laughs> is is it time that we stop having children? Yeah. For me, I guess one of my big takeaways is that 
we, we are a mass extinction event, but we are also a natural phenomenon. We are a part of the natural unfolding of nature in reality. Yeah, and we're also like, if you look at us like a plague, like sure you could say we're a plague, but we're also a plague who have has systems of ethics and morals and science that have discovered that we're turning into a plague. Yeah. And like, I don't know, we'll have to see how it plays out. We're fucked. That's how it's going to play out. <laughs> you really think so? Oh, for sure. I say we just burn more shit and like have fun while we can. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> just keep going, that is get that thing. oil pumping. <laughs> yeah, let's fucking get the engines going, man. I feel like that is the implicit attitude of sort of, you know, the, the conservative take on climate change. And it's not a wholly illogical one. It's the statement that we are that we this it's too big of a problem for us to fix so we might as well just like keep them on truck <laughs> so yeah. i will say i i talked with one of the execs from yaf young americans for freedom i think it is like yeah. a conservative group here on campus um addison and i sat down with him and um we talked about climate change and he was like oh yeah we cause climate change and we need to stop and like we need to figure this out so i think it's different between the the younger generations of conservatives yeah. and the older generation of conservatives who were like I don't know like oil was a huge business in the 60s and 70s it was running thing it was like oil was like the tech companies now like that was the new like the not new but like that was like the huge thing um so I think it is different with the younger generations and hopefully we get more of a consensus as younger people start to be represented more in politics, but younger people don't usually get represented very well in politics. I mean, look at everybody running for president. I think oh, they're so old. I think every I think every nominee still left in, like including Trump on the Republican side, besides Tulsi Gabbard, is over seventy. Yeah. Like wow. Isn't and, that crazy? They're and there's all also half a century older than us. Yeah, and room. not even um, not just in politics, but also in universities. I think, I think there's only like twenty, like fifteen to twenty percent. I don't know the number, but there's like the vast majority of university presidents are like boomer generation. Yeah. They're boomers. I'm not trying to say this to be derogative, <laughs> but, but they're they're baby boomers. And there's like there's like a small share of Gen Xers, and um, apparently it was very different in the in the past. Like in the yeah. 70s, 80s, you would have 40 year old people who were presidents of universities, mm -hmm. and were like just more connected to the younger generation. Whereas it seems like it seems like a lot of the older generation are like still holding on to things um and do we I, work longer I, now i yeah I, we work longer now we live longer now and also they're just a huge proportion of our population because i mean their name boomer comes from this huge boom in babies that were being produced so they're a large share of our population and also they're destroying the planet <laughs> <laughs> no they already did that yeah. but <laughs> well we've been doing it before their generation yeah. But, yeah. I mean, they've handed us a lot of nice things. For the sure. Crisis. They produced a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, we like to shit all the stuff they did wrong. But, like, or, you know, that wasn't necessarily the most helpful. But, you know, but we've always... But isn't that any generation? Like... Oh, for sure. I mean, they shit on us, too. Like, what are these yeah. kids doing nowadays? Yeah. Stop TikToking. Uh, wow. Start working. <laughs> I always wonder, like, <laughs> what's going to be the things that we're going to look back on and be like, oh, we were doing that for so long and we didn't even know it was wrong. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're completely, like, you're actually blind to it. It's just a norm yeah. while it's happening. I, I think feel... one thing is, like, in 20 years, I don't think zoos are going to exist. Yeah. I don't think I mean, what is going to exist? Zoos. Hmm. Zoos. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, I think... Hmm. I would like that. I don't know that they should. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of, of zoos, but I think they're... They're I think it's, cool with it's, reserves. it depends on like yeah. rescuing. Yeah, if they're things. rescuing or if they're extracting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, guess, I like, feel rehab. like no zoo really plans to free their animals anymore because otherwise they wouldn't survive. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting to see it from people's perspective who really know a lot about these animals because their behavior is really not what it would be like in nature. Yeah. 
yeah um, well they're they're in such a small artificial environment like all their life like they don't act like they would in nature that makes sense yeah and i don't like the argument where people are like well otherwise my kids wouldn't know what a lion would look like but i guess everyone now is know what a dinosaur looked like and i guess none of us has seen one yeah like, so you, I got, feel like well, you got pictures <laughs> <laughs> well i actually I, I listened to a podcast on that and it was like what we draw for dinosaurs is hugely like a huge misconception and like i think initially j- dinosaurs were drawn to be like super lazy and slow um and then there was this whole phase then of like shrink wrapping them and like trying to portray dinosaurs not as these like stupid animals that died off but rather as these like intense creatures that are super like, active. lean super scary looking. Yeah. yeah and like but maybe not so that was like a byproduct but it was more so to combat the idea that they were stupid and that's why they oh, were extinct that's interesting. I didn't know that, that they were um I, it was the podcast i sent you that i like it's 99 percent visible i'm gonna plug them on this podcast <laughs> no plug us back <laughs> <laughs> no but it was just talking about like yeah we have their bones and we can make kind of vague predictions of what they look like but imagine they were saying like a camel for example um you there's no evidence of the hump on a camel's back and yeah. so, like, if you find the bones, you would never know that because from bones alone, you can't estimate where, like, fat reserves are and everything. So what you're saying is all dinosaurs had humps. I was just <laughs> they could. That's the thing. <laughs> like, we wouldn't know. And so I think, but to a certain extent, like, maybe zoos aren't necessary anymore because of technology. Like, we we can see what like a lion or these animals look like that's why we watch things like nature documentaries because we want to be exposed and see these things but we don't necessarily want to i get the aspect of a zoo like you want to be up close and personal but is that necessary like is that just the un is that just the human desire that we should say okay this is detrimenting the animal's well-being and we should no longer do it yeah, and zoos smell terrible. <laughs> I don't get that. I don't get it. <laughs> I think it's also a way to look at animals in the way that they're supposed to entertain us. Yeah. Like whenever we go yeah. there, we want to see them. They should be visible and they should maybe doing something. Otherwise, it's boring. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can touch them, maybe not. But I don't like the way it makes people look at animals because this is just... I don't, I don't really get that. It's more like they're a product like yeah we're paying to like yeah consume it exactly yeah ideally it would be like you know a a nature reserve where they rescue animals like you know a turtle that lost its fin and will just get eaten by something if if we don't do anything about it or or animals that something happened to them they wouldn't be able to survive in the wild and Mm -hmm. ideally it would just be like supported by i don't know the government money or or charity and then like maybe like once a week or something kids could come in and like take a look at them but like i I have a question so this is actually something um a german boy asked me and it was like to what right or to like to what extent do humans have the right to intervene in nature none we're and not the fucking world police. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so Although we, we try to be. Yeah. Especially the U.S. Go over here, intervene with this. Go over here, intervene with that. Take yeah. some oil from here. Take some oil from there. Take a turtle. Put him in a zoo. Yeah, exactly. Like, we, we think we're doing the right thing because, back to the theme of suffering, we want to prevent suffering to some extent. Yeah. But it's very selective. I th- I I disagree. I think we should. I like. I do like the idea of humans I- intervening and, and yeah. just given the fact that we do necessarily have a relationship with animals, in, and it's a horribly destructive relationship, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time. So having you know a couple of people basically at the fringes trying to pull back on that destruction, trying to yeah. uh, preserve these things that are amazing and and. I mean, like, I think that that's really incredible on, on a lot of different levels. Yeah, I think I think preventing undue suffering is always a just cause, provided that you're sure or have, you can never be sure, you have a high degree of confidence that what you're doing won't cause more undue suffering 
than would happen if you didn't do that. Which well, separates, like, what Blake was talking about with, like, the U.S. being the world police and going in places. Like, we go into, like, political, like... We go in, like, topple regimes, and we have no clue what the political ramifications would be. Like, those are complex systems. Right, but who's to be the judge of, like, taking this turtle that has a messed up fin and, like, putting it over here to preserve it? Who's judging whether that's a positive or negative What about the the animal that was going to eat that turtle? Right, that's a benefit for that animal that's going to eat it, and now we're taking away that opportunity for the other animal. Well, hope they're fit enough to not just, like, prey on the weakest. Also, I feel like, realistically... (laughs) <laughs> once again we are in- disrupting these ecosystems to a ridiculous extent any effort towards the positive is like but not going to be positive? anywhere near who's determining effect. what the positive is like christina said another animal could be eating that animal that we're trying to preserve and so we're taking it putting it into this thing because we want to conserve it because we feel like we're caring but it could be the meal of another animal and now that animal is suffering because a meal that was there is now gone you know okay so i would say um I think we look at it by fairness. Like if if something's disabled, we tend to protect it. Also, I feel like, like we do that in our own society. Yeah, and, I, right, I feel like it's protect those those disabled things though. Like one, I feel like it's highly <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 Take all the ramps uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yes. Okay. One, I feel like it's highly unlikely that conservation efforts are like making a significant negative impact on any particular spe- like species ability to survive. It's not like we're pulling tens of thousands of like injured zebras out of, out of um, like the mouth the, the of a lion. I, I have a <laughs> counter argument though. Wait, you can finish your point. And yeah. So my second point is it's, we're not just doing like conservation efforts are not just to reduce the sufferings of specific animals. It's to, preserve certain species species that would otherwise die out if it wasn't for our efforts and i think that's worth incredibly worthwhile for many reasons one of which is just that it can it preserves the novelty and uniqueness and interestingness of life of the universe of reality Right, but what if nature is totally fighting against that and like humans have have taken up this responsibility (laughs) to be like like I said, the world police of these conservation efforts and like everything that nature is saying, this global warming thing is saying like, okay, you guys are the problem here. You're trying to do all this shit and guess what? It's not working. So we're going to try and wipe you out. What? <laughs> like global warming is, is sort of this sign towards us that like what we're doing is not working. Yes. Right. And so we have this uh, sort of internal it seems at least motivation to go and conserve this and this and that. Yeah. And it's like, why is the diversity that you're talking about so spectacular? Like why? I think Max said novelty. Or novelty, novelty right. Of life. Why the, is that, why is that worth con- conservation? For the, um, and um, I think there's a lot of different reasons. I think for one, it, 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 like novelty in the sense of something being unique and special, there are f- it's i think there are very few things more unique and special than a species a species that is the product of literally billions of years of evolution towards a unique end that only exists if we like conserve it and allow it to continue that that's something special that is something beautiful and unique in so much as anything can be said to be special like a beautiful guitar or a right, car but or whatever. Life that's a going species. to decay is going to give life to other species. Bacteria not that are going on to our decay time con- scales. I could the, say Max the bacteria. What the argument has shifted though. The less about Max isn't arguing for the supporting of life or saying that it's anything more beneficial for the whole cycle as it as it pertains to like the, the entirety of it. Yeah. But just saying that as humans, we seem to value this abstract thing, whether it's like beauty or novelty or, you know, like the same way you said, it's a really, really nice guitar or a really unique thing or a very special process. And we appreciate that intangibleness of it, even though I guess it's tangible because it's an animal, 
but the process behind it, we appreciate. Right, but who are we to put value on one or another? Why should this one species of animal that has taken a long time to get to be more important than the bacteria that are going to be eating that carcass when the thing is decaying? Because the bacteria will be there anyway. It's not, not the like... same species of bacteria. The bacteria is also evolving. It's, uh, I'd say that in, okay, biologically, when we preserve one species, it's highly unlikely that preserving one species, say a unique type of lion or something, that, that a, that, that act of preservation will kill off another unique species. I have, have that's like, I was going to say, because pandas are endangered because they can barely conceive more pandas to maintain their population and mm -hmm. so it is through human intervention because i think it's interesting like what we justify in like conserving certain species that we consider novel mm -hmm. and oftentimes it has to do with cuteness mm -hmm. yeah how much do they look like us what do they look mm -hmm. like do we like what they look like and that plays a huge role into do we bother conserving them or not so things like pandas probably things like koalas now because of Australia. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how that's all going. But then we ignore other species, which are maybe like insects and stuff. Yeah, like, like fish. That we are, can't are really fish, like, to them as much, but they're still just they're as still living. They're still just as like alive, but we don't put as much value because we don't, we just don't think they're as cute or and we so, don't think they're as like interesting. So therefore they go extinct. So there's, right, there's one factor. Being, like projected onto that. There's one factor for me that I think is inherently valuable, not just because it's similar to us. And uh, I think that's being either like social slash conscious. Mm. Like there's, you seem to be able to tell that certain animals are more conscious of what's happening than others. And with consciousness, we could come suffering. Mm. So you, you're actually preventing by by saving a lion who is much more conscious than bacteria, as far as we can tell, more conscious things like a lion can experience a lot more suffering than bacteria can. We'll just wipe all that crap out. They reproduce like crazy on a crazy time scale. Like they're, they reproduce so quickly and have such little consciousness that I think they're less valuable. Yeah. Right, but is consciousness an admirable trait in a living organism? I would say I think so. not only is and it admirable. who's determining why and like... I would say, um, yes, I think one could make a serious argument that consciousness is far more novel and unique and rare than like uncon like a lack of consciousness. But what kind of scale are we using here? Like how are you okay, determining... Well, levels of development. Like this, this isn't... this. It is a immutable fact that a lion is is more, um, ba -ba 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 -ba, more um, neurally developed than a bacteria, sure. and and that the the relative percentages of animals that have developed higher order thinking capacities and all that, and um, Eric, as you said, emotional capacities, those are. A rarity, and I think that they are that with some the, uh, unique. L you're gonna see less of them, and they represent a higher order of complexity in the universe. And I think those are real metrics by which we can say those are special. We want to preserve those because also if we don't, they they will die off, and there's no way to get them back. Right, but they're gonna die off anyways. Not necessarily. You can use that argument for anything, though. Sure. Like, yeah. Pull a time scale, and everything's irrelevant. I think one interesting thing, though, is that this is where there's a huge dividing factor in people's thoughts, because this is when people ask, is human life more valuable than other animals' lives? Yes. And that's had a huge implication then in our society of, you know, people do think because people are humans are more conscious than other animals that, yeah, you know what, all of this suffering that's happening to the, these animals is just. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily true just because maybe we're a little more conscious and more thoughtful than, say, a lion or a lobster. Yeah, my only point is like humans make the decision of what to conserve based on their values and other organisms might not share those same values. And so like we can continue to conserve things, but like. But at the same maybe time, it's not maybe the earth isn't in agreement with what we're conserving. But at the same time, looking from a Darwinian standpoint, we out 
competed all those other animals to have this amount of resources and power. So I think our values are more valuable than yeah. other animals. We have the unique They're capacity full. amongst life to have values. As, as you were saying earlier, Eric. Well, other animals definitely have values. Not in the higher level complexity, like higher level thinking skills. They can't that we articulate do. their values. The, the ability sure, to come like, up. They definitely have value. They have them, but ours are more fit. More fit. And what do you mean? Ours make us more fit. Because Our we've values. outcompeted all those other animals. This was the dividing factor between the German guy and I when he asked me this question. Because I was kind of arguing in the sense that, do, do we have the right to maybe kill animals and things like that? Either to consume or to maintain populations. And his, his opinion was not at all that we don't necessarily have that right. And... It's it's hard. And it's I, a hard. Well, I think we have I respect right, that sure. we have the right to conserve or kill or whatever because we've yeah outcompeted those other animals. It seems obvious. Like what is, what is a right? It's just like the ability to perform some action. Yeah, and I think it, when when it gets to the point of asking about rights and all that, the, the there is not some. I, I do not believe at least that there is some grand cosmic, you know, system of what is specifically right and wrong. Those values. Uh, came into being with us humans and they evolved alongside us. I think uh, to answer one of your earlier questions of like in the animal kingdom, who's to say like what, what if we, the th choices we make, if they're right or wrong, I would say rightness and wrongness is a, is a human thing. We are the force in nature that has the capacity to make those decisions. We have the power to do so, and we have the mental capacity to do so in a way that other animals do not. And that does confer on us a unique privilege, because I think it's a beautiful thing, mm. one of the most admirable things about humans, that we expen extend our compassion right, to the rest of the world, but also a responsibility to, our to like, do so. Do you so. acknowledge that it's just to our end? We're making those decisions for our own benefit. No, because we're, we no, think we're, it's a cute thing. No. Because you don't think it's... We try I, to look after everything. I mean, we're sitting here talking about climate change. Well, we and like, want to look after everything that we value. I like, think... Yes, that doesn't that doesn't make it somehow selfish. I think it does, but it's not an inherently negative thing. I, yeah, um, it doesn't have yeah. to be negative, but because it's of, definitely yeah. we're looking after the things we value. A lot of times we think of selfishness as something uh, morally wrong, but it seems to me, you know, when you help an animal out, you're bettering that animal's existence, but also it gives this nice satisfaction. You're like, I'm helping out life, and it's very positive, and things are kind of lining up. That is a self-interest, and it's a selfish thing to do, but it helps, you know? I think it's I, also maybe making up for all the damage we do, because I guess so many animals wouldn't have to be rescued if we didn't put them in the situation. So I guess we just have that feeling that we should help as much as we can. Yeah, especially like I was going to bring that up when we were talking specifically about like saving the turtle who lost his yeah. fin or whatever. <laughs> like if we were the ones who caused their numbers to go down to 50, like we kind of have a responsibility to help out. <laughs> and, and we are we are the ones, you know, yeah. for just a, a lot of the times we are. Yeah, A lot of the times some some animals just get out competed and just messed up in their own environment. But a lot of the times we contribute to it or some of the times it's like we contribute like 95 percent of it one point that i want to speak to, towards is the idea of us being separate from the rest of the nature the idea that it's for our own benefit or our own values that we interact with the rest of nature is placing a um, duality between us and the rest of nature i would make the argument that we are the conscious element of nature we are nature itself that be, has become self-aware and has the capacity towards empathy towards elements of itself. And we largely direct that empathy just towards people and like elements of our own species. But the fact that we have the capacity to direct that empathy outside of us, I think connects us to that grander picture of nature. The most heartwarming things you'll ever see are like an animal that's not a human helping out another animal that's not a human yeah those those videos just, they're, they're amazing and like one thing i really love to see too is 
going back to how I think that social creatures are more valuable. Um, I don't, I mean, this isn't, this isn't like a, a logical argument, but it just like warms my heart when my dog does something messed up and then like, you can tell he's like, oh, oh I know I did something wrong. Like, <laughs> it's, it's so nice. Like it's so some feeling inside me guides me to want to protect those things more than the cockroach on the floor. <laughs> On that note, go hug a dog, check out some Pet a cat. Yeah, cool animal videos on YouTube. And, and have uh, turtle soup. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shout out. <laughs> nice.